caveat. You should probably only have a minimum of five secondary sources if you're at the lower end of the number of the word count scale. Why? Because if you're writing a 3,000 or more word paper, you probably need, and I don't mean need to pad out. I mean, your argument is probably such that you need that additional evidence. Okay? This Here's one of the reasons I'm doing this. This is for those of you. You might know who you are. I don't. Because I've only had maybe, I think, one or two of you that I've had write papers for me before. Maybe three. Um, this is really for those of you who are really good, concise writers. That is... You know how to pack the most punch with the least number of words. In other words, you're a born poet. Okay? Told my previous class. Faulkner said, I think it was in his Nobel Prize winning speech, he's a novelist, not a poet, because the poets say the most with the least number of words. So, if you can say everything you need to say with the least number of words, 1,600 is fine. If you need more, I'm not saying J.R. is not a poet. That is because some arguments will require a lot more space than something else. For example, you could choose for your paper, you could choose to do an explication of a poem. Well, you might be able to do that in 1,600 words. You can't argue about you know, the contrasting experiences of love in Shakespeare's sonnets in 1,600 words. Uh-uh. And you're going to need twice that. <laughs> so that's not a proof. Kidding. Um, so those are the changes. Due dates, all that, remain the same. Okay? Everybody clear about that stuff? Mm -hmm. So recitations, extra credit, worth 20 to 30 points. Still has to be done by, what, the 4th, I think? Yeah. December? By the 4th of December? Yeah, I'm not doing it in January. <laughs> <laughs> I might for my class beginning in January, but you guys are screwed by then. I mean, you know, and I will, I will say, if, if your final paper isn't in my hand, even though it's got a due date of 27th, if I were to, you know, something happen and become really nice and give you an extension, if it's not in my hands when I leave campus... On December 4th, it's an F. Period. I tell that all. Um, when I leave campus, guess what? I don't come back. I do not. I do all my grading at home. I turn in my grades. If I come back, it's only because I'm required, you know, to attend graduation or something like that, which I shouldn't be this year. So if it's not in my hands, you're done. All right. So get it into your hands. So make sure, well, the 27th. Yeah. Good. Yeah, how about like a uh, school ended, or at least a semester ended at like, you know, the 13th of December? I don't care. You don't care? Yeah, no, nope. Do we have a final exam? exam? You don't have a final exam? We do. You do have a final exam. You have a final exam on the 13th from 10 a.m. to 12. Well, I'll be here that day. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> forgot about it. Big thing I forgot about. <laughs> Those people will be long credited by then. Yeah, because if it's not, it will be. <laughs> and, and, you know, do follow these guidelines, like things about um, titles and such. You don't put a title. Don't you get an F. Yeah. yeah. You, I mean, I give you a big, looks like that, just a big F, and then I don't have to read it, so thank you. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> you don't want to test me. Some of you have had me before, and you've probably heard stories. Uh, I'm serious. Did I go over how I... I don't think I did, because no, we missed no, the first day of class. Real briefly, here's what I do when I, some of you heard this little spiel before. Here's what I do when I get papers. First thing, because I'm anal, I alphabetize them by author's last name. Go with the A's first to the end. And I look for a title. If it doesn't have a title, I put it over, actually I should put it over here, follows Christ's example. Put it over here, this is the goats. These are going to hell. <laughs> okay. All these, they just get an F. I don't even look at them. So wait a minute, like, do you want like a whole page for no. this one title, or do you just want follow the directions? Oh, okay. 
points on the directions, okay? So I set those over there. Usually, even after I give the speech, there will be one, one person every class. And I'm like, I don't believe them. <laughs> Go ahead. Like Dirty Harry says, you feel lucky today, punk? Okay. So I put, that over, put those over there. They get an F. The others, I now have. Then I turn to the works cited page. If there is a minimum number of secondary sources, I go through and count those secondary sources, not the primary ones. And if there's four, go to hell. <laughs> it gets put in that pile. Why? You're too stupid to be in college. If you can't follow directions, you shouldn't be. I'm honest. I know, you're not supposed to say stuff like that. You're supposed to be warm and welcoming, student learning centered environment, all that. Can't follow directions, you shouldn't be here, okay? So, once I do that, in some of my classes, my lower division, for example, which I know a couple of you have had, um, I have required number of quotations because some of the incoming freshmen and sophomores otherwise won't quote at all. So they don't have any supporting evidence. So it's, I really think this, and I want you to believe me. <laughs> this deserves an A. And I'm like, no, it doesn't, because there's no evidence. Yeah. <laughs> Out into, into the outer darkness where there's gnashing of teeth and such. Once you pass, you know, that, then I read them. Okay? So because there's not required number of quotations, title and formatting stuff, if I get a paper in here, as I'm not kidding, I literally had in font this size. Yeah, where I could paste it on that wall and read it from back here. Probably even with these off, that's going to get an F. Okay, because why? You didn't follow directions. I tell you somewhere in here what font size to use. Use 11 or 12 point times New Roman, in fact. Okay. Now I'm not going to go through and go, is this really Times New Roman or is this Calabria? <laughs> but don't put it in a squirrely font. Respectable font. I, I mean, I'm not... You come... Thank you. Which I know is dead in the United States. I've had students turn in papers in all cursive font, curly Q font, purple font, Pink font, bold, the entire paper bold faced. I've had papers entirely in all caps. Okay. I heard that uh, people from the military uh, are told to write in all caps when they're writing uh, reports. Not the military. I've not had any military do that. And I've had a lot of. excited about what they have to say, like, in this paper. <laughs> I've had papers with doodles in the side, you know. And let me back up for just a second. If the day the paper is due, you come in and you realize, you know, you're reading over it, hopefully. You're reading over it and you find a typo or something, fix it. Pull out a pen and fix it. It's better that you find it and fix it that way than that I find it. Now, I'm not going to fail a paper because it's got a single typo, Okay. But I will tell you one of my big bugaboos is spelling errors. Awesome. Especially if that spelling error involves the author's name that you are writing about. Or if it's a character you're writing. You're writing about, you know, I don't know, Sir Gawain. And you spell his name. Gawain. Gawain. Okay. And you do that 30 times. That's probably just from that. You're in the low D. <laughs> so the rest of the content had just ought to be superb. <laughs> but more than likely, when you have that kind of error, mm, the rest of the content isn't that good. Okay? Don't count on spell checkers. A spell checker will never catch the difference between that. 
And you might be a fast enough typist, you're typing on along, and your fingers type one thing, and your brain means something else. And when you read it, you know what you meant, so your brain fills in what you meant. Okay? My brain doesn't know what you meant. My brain only knows what you tell me. So, as I tell students, one, keep it simple. And I don't, we're not supposed to say that in English classes, because you guys are supposed to be are supposed to be able to BS better than anybody else. I mean, just slather it on. No, keep it simple, okay? Be exact, be precise, say what you mean, mean what you say. If you have any doubt about what you mean, you might want to work on that a little bit. You might want to clarify that, okay? Last bit of advice before we, if we ever get to Shakespeare. Um, have somebody else read your paper. I don't care who. Give it to a friend. Give it to somebody in the class. Night before it's due or two days before it's due. Just say, hey, would you mind reading this? Not because each of you is necessarily qualified. I'm going to use, watch my words a little bit. Qualified to fully proofread somebody else's work. But because your brain is different than the author's brain, and your brain won't fill in the gaps that your author's brain skipped as you wrote the paper and as you proofread the paper. Okay? I am not one for quote unquote workshopping peer review. Why? I'm not casting aspersions on anybody in here. But peer A is usually going to be, with some exceptions, about as bright as peer B, and vice versa. Now, I could put that in a more negative term. Peer A is also going to be about as dumb as peer B. So peer A, peer B, neither of them might know what a comma splice is. And, and this is why I think it is utterly asinine to have students, whether high school, college, get all of their you know comments from Peers. This is one of the reasons, and this is on, it'll be on YouTube now, so if any of my colleagues want to have problems with this, they can talk to me. This is why I don't send students to the writing center. Because some of your peers there, that is, some of the people doing the um, assisting, are your peers. They're undergraduate students. Okay? Some of them are new graduate students, which means what? They were undergraduate students six months ago. In a hell of a lot of different Okay. Some of them are really good. I don't know who. <laughs> Just saying that. But I've had too many students go over there with a C paper and come back with a D or F paper because they've had perfectly good semicolons suggested to be commas. And they went from perfectly good independent clauses separated by colon to comma splices, okay? Or periods just thrown in left and right and, you know, things like that. Okay, all that aside, but I will grade fairly, and I'm not looking for anything, okay? No matter what your paper is, I'm not looking for anything. That is, I don't have an ax to grind about any of this. You can interpret it however you want with a couple of provisos. One, however you interpret it, has got to be based on what's there. Don't tell me Sir Brown and the Green Knight is about a visitor from Mars. A green man, you know, because there's no Mars mentioned. All right? So, however you interpret, it's got to be based on the text. Two, strong thesis. Strong thesis. What's that mean? Good. I want a Trumpian thesis. That is, I want that thesis to be like Trump on Twitter. You, you never have any doubts what Trump means when he <laughs> tweets. It's black and white. Your thesis ought to be black and white. What does that mean? What's a thesis? Sir Gowan is, relies on chivalry in order to pass the tests that he's given. Okay, that's not bad. It's not really strong because the word, verb rely. Kind of weak. Sir Gowan fails at 
you know, passing chivalry. That's pretty strong. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's. There's no sitting on the fence. In fact, the fence really isn't even viewed there. It's you know really strong. In other words, the thesis ought to grab me by the shirt and kind of. Every person in here has been in an argument, right? Everybody is in has been in an ar hopefully. Because if you've not been in an argument, I mean, you're a slug. Don't be a slug. Be a forceful slug and stand up and show those horns. So, what do you do when you get in an argument with somebody? You have a fight, right? That's what your thesis is. Your thesis is picking a fight. Listen, Sherman, you're an idiot. If you don't agree that, and there's your thesis statement. And then what do you do? Prove it. So how do you prove it? Here's your first proof. That's your second proof. Just go through, prove it. Okay? All right. Enough there. Dates. So, the Middle English period ended not in 1485. And we call it the Middle English period because we date it by the form of the language spoken. But it didn't end in 1485 on the dot. That is, people didn't suddenly start speaking early modern English in 1486 or something like that. So why do we, you know, use the date 1485? Well, because it's a nice historical data point. Why? Because in 1485, as Shakespeare put it, Richard the first, Richard the third, excuse me, famously cried, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse, as he fought Henry Tudor at the Battle of Bosworth Field and died. Richard the third was defeated. Henry Tudor became Henry the seventh. The end of the English rose Rose of the war, war, Wards. <laughs> That's what happens when you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. The Wars of the Roses. Okay? The English Civil War between the houses of Lancaster and York. All right? By the way, in case you're not familiar with this, Richard III's body was just discovered in 2012. Really? Yes. In the town of Leicester, no, they were lot, right? digging up a parking lot getting ready for some building, and they're like, well, look at this, a sarcophagus, a coffin of lead. So it's a coffin of lead, that means somebody pretty important is buried in here. And they get into the coffin, and they find a guy with a back shaped kind of like this, his spine. Arrow, head bashed in a little, people started going, hmm. <laughs> DNA tests. Why? Because there are descendants of Richard III still alive today. Proved. This is Richard's body. Nobody knew where he had been buried. Okay? Now, well, there was actually, it was found in part of an abbey. I think it was an, it was an abbey or monastery that had been totally, completely forgotten about. Okay? Um, so they found the body. He's been reinterred in where? Leicester Cathedral, I think. Nice little monument. The uh, descendants, you know, wanted to have a nice national ceremony. Even though most people's awareness of Richard III is through Shakespeare. And, and Shakespeare portrays story. him as an evil mm -hmm. SOB. Okay? The little bit of surviving ed evidence from his reign suggests he was actually a pretty good king. And he was actually fairly well liked. Shakespeare portrays him evilly. Why? Well, that he's the Tudors? Yeah, exactly. Because who defeated him? Henry VII. Well, Henry VII was what? To the monarch who was reigning when Shakespeare was writing Richard III. Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Sorry, where is she? Here she is. Queen Elizabeth I was the granddaughter of Henry VII. So you have a little bit of nationalistic propaganda going on here. Okay? So let me back up. So Henry VII reigns, what is that, about 23 years? 
14, 24 years, 1485 to 1509. Henry, later called the Eighth, has an older brother named Arthur. Arthur gets married to, what's her name? Catherine, okay? Um, when he was 14, royal marriage, you know, it's okay. When he was 14, and he dies six months later. Henry will then marry Arthur's wife, because Arthur's dead. Now, is that a problem? A guy marrying his brother's wife? Okay, dead brother's wife, big deal. It's still incest with this one proviso. Not if the marriage was never consummated. And they appealed to the Pope, and they told the Pope, oh, no, 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 they got married, but they never had sex. Don't worry about it. Pope agreed. Henry marries Catherine. Okay, this is the Catherine of Aragon. Um, she dies. Or excuse me. Before she dies, they get that marriage annulled. Okay. How is it going to go into this? I'm not going to go into this. Out of Catherine, literally, out of Catherine comes. Mary, Henry VIII's first child, right? After Catherine, after Mary is born, he gets the marriage annulled. Why? Well, you know, because she was my brother's first wife. Or she was my brother's wife. Wait, Why? because uh, I thought it was because, you know, he couldn't get like a male heir. Well, yeah, I mean, she couldn't do that either, but that's not cause for annulment. Oh. You got to have a better cause for annulment. So the cause for annulment was, yeah, but she was my brother's wife. And so what the Pope should have said was, yeah, but you said it was okay. I mean, you said it was never, yeah, but it turns out it was, you know. So Henry VIII rules, notice, almost 40 years. Long reign, 38. When he gets, when he becomes king here, he's only about 18 years old. He's young, he's handsome, he's tall, he's powerful. Pick your Chris, you know, because Pine, Hemsworth, whichever, <laughs> Pratt, one of them, okay? If you go to, go to the town of Winchester, southwest of London, and go to the Great Hall at Winchester, and look all around, and then you look, I we talked about this before, look at the round table, that was supposed to be King Arthur's round table. King Arthur was repainted during Henry's reign to look like Henry when he was about 20 years old, okay? By the time he dies, in 1547, I'm not kidding. He's like this big. Because you can go to the Tower of London and see his armor. It's, it's like this. Okay. Huge. Was he fat? Or was yeah, he no, he was grossly, 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 obscenely, obesely overweight. Okay? I mean, six, seven hundred pounds. Oh, beastly overweight. Okay? He dies. His eldest son, actually his only son, becomes king. Even though Mary is the eldest. Is the eldest. And then you have Queen Elizabeth. She's second eldest, or Elizabeth. She's second eldest. Notice all three children, three different mothers, half siblings. Okay? He becomes king. He only reigns for six years. He dies in his teens. He's sickly. Okay, We're going to talk about Henry and what he does here. Henry starts the Protestant Reformation, kind of. We'll talk about this over here. Edward's a real Protestant. It's under him that the Book of Common Prayer is first written, okay, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer and such. But he dies. He dies, and what happens? Well, he doesn't have any male heirs. So we go back to the eldest sister. Mary becomes queen, 1553 to 58. From whom we get the name of a drink. Bloody Mary's. Ah, that is not. Why? She's not. Rain of blood. She's Catholic. She's not kind of your nominal Catholic, you know. Yeah, go to Mass at Easter and Nativity. and No, she's full bore Catholic. To the extent she starts stringing up Protestants. Literally. 
stringing up Protestants. Go into Oxford, get off the train, walk into Oxford, down, where is it? Broad Street, I think. And you'll find this big monument. And the monument is to two people, a bishop and another guy, who were burned at the stake by, by um, Mary. Okay, so, I mean, she was hog wild for burning, cat, burning Protestants. She dies in 58. Her little sister becomes queen, Queen Elizabeth. Notice how long she reigns. 45 years. This is now, if I remember correctly, I think she has the longest reign of England, any English monarch up to this point. Okay. The, the next one with a longer reign than Elizabeth's, you don't get until the 19th century, Queen Victoria. And then she gets passed by QE2. Because Queen Elizabeth's been, man, that old gal's been kicking for a long time. 65 years? Yeah. I think it is. Since 53. She just really doesn't want her son to take over. <laughs> <laughs> He's not made some good life choices. <laughs> One would say neither does she. Anyways, 58 to 1603. She comes in as a... Let's just call her, we'll use the favorite political term today of the favorite political class. She's a moderate. She's a good moderate Protestant. She kind of encapsulates or prefigures Bill Clinton's old don't ask, don't tell policy. That is, I won't ask you if you're a Catholic, but don't tell me if you're a Catholic. So don't tell me you're a Catholic also means what? Don't go shouting. It's don't go start doing catholic -y stuff. Like having open Catholic meetings. No. If you're a priest, don't go walking around in a collar. So just, you know, keep your little perversion off to the side, as it were. Okay? Yes? What does that say right there by 1533? Here? Mm -hmm. uh, no, like uh, right there. Like to this right. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Oh, okay. Um, so, she kind of continues on some of the stuff her brother did. Okay. So, we get a refinement of Protestant belief. We get, you know, certain articles of religion, that is, to be a good Anglican, you have to subscribe to. All right. Until, because I don't have it up here. Why? Until 1588. Anybody know what happened in 1588? The Spanish, the Spanish Armada. Philip of Spain, Philip II of Spain, sends over 300 galleons from Spain to invade England. But they're, it's not just a total foreign invasion. They are being welcomed in the north of England by Catholics. Okay? The Parliament, early in this period, beginning around 1560, they started passing some anti-Catholic laws. Or, let me put it this way, pro-Protestant laws. For example, one of them that Shakespeare's father had to deal with was, you got to get rid of religious imagery in the churches. you got to get rid of the iconography that's painted on the walls. So, slap some paint up over that. Cover that stuff up. Why? It's all idolatry. It all goes against the Ten Commandments. No graven image kind of thing. Right? Shakespeare's father had to deal with that because he was the alderman in charge. He was the mayor for, for a point. So that's kind of this, this anti-Catholicism is building. And it reaches its head in 1588 when Spaniards, Catholics, try to invade. But lo and behold, as God is our Savior, a hurricane destroys over 250 of those Spanish galleons, and the English wipe out the rest. Because of that, Queen Elizabeth was thought to be favored by God. And she gets a new nickname, Gloriana. Gloriana. Okay? Concomitant with that is a real strong rise in nationalism. What happened to the United States after 9-11? 
Yeah, America, put my flag up, you know. Go kill me some. Toby Keith. Right? Yeah, Toby Keith, exactly. Okay? So, exact same thing starts happening. Parliament gets much more stringent in their laws. So that by 1590, it's now illegal to be Catholic in England. Not illegal, oh, I'm going to give you a ticket. Illegal, it's a capital offense. Okay? So it's like he killed somebody, right? Yeah. If you, if the magistrate, if the authorities catch a, someone who is openly being Catholic, more specifically, you know, if you were a Catholic priest and you were caught, that in itself, you know, be hung. If you saw Skyfall, James Bond film, and they have the beautiful scene up in the house up in Scotland, and they're getting ready, the bad guys are getting ready to come in and kill everybody, and they take them down into the little tunnel that goes down. Remember what that was called? The priest's hole. That's where Catholic priests would hide and get away while the bad old Protestants were coming to Kill and such. So, John Dunn, an author we're going to read about, he had an uncle who was a priest. He had to flee to the continent. He had a brother who was imprisoned because Dunn's family was Catholic. Shakespeare's family was Catholic. Okay? Most people will say, yeah, what was Shakespeare? Oh, well, you know, modern sensibility. He was an atheist. He didn't believe anything. Yeah, nonsense. Because what you see in Shakespeare's play is you get this tug between Catholicism and Protestantism. I don't think that means Shakespeare's in the middle. I think Shakespeare, being the thinker that he is, wants to portray the currents of the day. Okay? I think he was probably leaning a little bit more on the Catholic side than he does on the Protestant side. So, Queen Elizabeth dies then in 1603. What is another nickname for Elizabeth? We get two state names. Virgin Virginia, right? And West Virginia. The Virgin Queen. Yeah, right. <laughs> she had enough boyfriends. She, she wasn't a virgin. More than likely she wasn't. Okay? But she didn't have an heir. So who's going to be king? Or queen? Cousin. Or... Yeah, he's a cousin. James, right? Yeah. James the first of England, Scotland, right? who was James the Sixth of Scotland. Okay? So James the Sixth of Scotland becomes James the First of England. Well, that must have gone really well with English. Well, I mean, it was better than what they were expecting, because they had no idea. There wasn't an announcement in the Washington Post about here's what's going to happen when Queen Elizabeth dies. Nobody knew. It was kind of sudden that this happened. James comes down, and he's more or less Protestant. Um, fancies himself an intellectual. Writes a book on demons called Demonology. Real interested in demons and witchcraft and stuff. It is thought that's why Shakespeare writes Macbeth. Or the Scottish play, as I should say, so I don't walk out of here and get shot or break a leg or something. Uh, you know, there's a whole story about Macbeth. So, you know, because Macbeth's about a Scottish king, okay? And it's got witches and demons and such in it. So, James, 1603 to 25, he has a couple of sons. His eldest son dies when he's only 11 or 12 years old. Prince Harry, or Harry, his second son, Charles, becomes king in 1625, and he reigns to 49, Charles I. Charles marries a Spanish princess, Henrietta Maria, okay? thoroughgoing, dyed-in-the-wool Catholic, and openly so. Charles has a tumultuous relationship, let's say, with Parliament. It would be kind of like Trump with not a Congress that is somewhat narrowly split. It would be like Trump with 300 Democrat members in the House of Representatives. 
rather than what's going to be 230 maybe. Okay? So they go back and forth until 1649, when during the English civil wars between the Protestants, the Puritans, and what are called the Cavaliers or the Roundheads, okay, um, people who are monarchical supporters, they support the monarchy and all that kind of stuff, the Protestants don't, Parliament arrests Charles I. They charge him with treason and they execute him. Parliament executes the king publicly. That's... You can imagine that, you know, causes a little few problems. And you get an 11 year period called the interregnum. What's it literally mean? Inter between regnum kings. 11 year period, this is the, and it's why they still use this word today in talking about the UK. This is the Commonwealth. What does Commonwealth mean? We all hold the wealth in common. It's kind of like, you know, Marxist Nirvana, Nirvana, okay? Before Marx. So it's the Commonwealth. We don't have a king during the Commonwealth. No, 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 no. We have Oliver Cromwell, but he's not king, Oliver Cromwell. We're going to invent a title. He's the Lord Protector. And guess what happens when he dies? His son, Richard Cromwell, becomes Lord Protector. As Shakespeare famously says, a rose by any other name is still a rose. A king by any other name is still a king. Okay? Richard Cromwell... Now, Oliver Cromwell dies. His son becomes king for about two years. And in 1660, he gives it up. That is, he turns over control to Charles II. Okay? Who is Charles II? Charles I's eldest son. This is what's called the Restoration. Why? Because it's the restoration the monarch. of the Stuart monarchy. Because James I is James Stuart. S T U A R T. Yes. Why wasn't Charles II immediately following Charles I? Is it because his dad uh, did treason? Um, like he fled to France. Okay. So he was you know, they were, they were lopping off heads. <laughs> okay. What, what happened to Charles the First wife? Uh, probably also executed. Probably, yeah. No, Henrietta Maria wasn't executed. I'm pretty sure she went off to France too. Oh. So. Someone's got to raise that son, right? Right. So Charles the Second comes back. He reigns for 15 years. This is called the Stuart Monarchy, uh, the restoration of the Stuart Monarchy. This is called the Restoration in English literary history, where we see the reopening of playhouses. Why? Because the Puritans closed them down in 1642. So no more Globe. No more Shakespeare plays from 1642 to 1660. Okay? And then you get all the restoration, you know, um, playwrights. There are a couple in, in here. All the others whom I'm not thinking of at the moment. Okay? So Charles II dies. And his brother, younger brother, James, becomes king. He is James II. Okay. By the way, Charles II is then, if I remember correctly, Charles the First. No. He's got to be Charles the Second, also of Scotland. Okay. Because the monarchies have been united because of James. So. He's James the second of England, James the seventh of Scotland. And in 1688, the problem with James, James becomes king, 1685. Problem with James is he's a thoroughgoing Catholic. He came from France, because that's where he was living. Parliament finally has enough of him. Because James apparently has agreed 
when he comes over, has agreed with French authorities and such, he's going to try to make England Catholic. Parliament doesn't like that idea. So Parliament invites William III, or William of Orange, as he's called, Netherlands, and his wife, Mary, to come over. Okay? Their relationship is because Mary is the daughter of, I think, Charles II. It's either Charles II or Charles I. Okay? They're Protestant. Um, if you ever pay attention to, or if you've ever paid attention to St. Patrick's Day, not the green beer and all that kind of nonsense. And you watch what happens, for example, in Ireland or in England or Northern Ireland. Not everybody loves St. Patrick's Day, especially if you are an Ulster Protestant. Because on St. Patrick's Day, Ulster Protestants will dress in orange. It's related to this, his William of Orange. He was Protestant. Okay. This is what's called the Glorious Revolution. It's also called the Bloodless Revolution. Why? When William and Mary come, guess what James II does? Nope. He flees. He goes to France. Parliament takes that as he abdicates the throne. Not a shot is fired. No blood is lost. And that's 1688. Okay, now let me come back over here. Let me come back over here. We can get rid of Gawain. <laughs> so, back to Henry VIII for a moment. In 1521, he is called, uh, let me back up even more. Back up over here to Luther. Martin Luther, 1517, October 31st, anybody knows what he does? <laughs> Nails the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. What are the 95 Theses? Uh, reasons why the church sucks, <laughs> essentially. There is a, Not quite. There is a different differentiation with the church where he thinks they should include... Yeah, they're points of... Here are problems. We need to clean this up. He doesn't want to start a revolution. He doesn't want to start a reformation. He wants to just clean up these issues. These are 95 problems he has. Okay? Nails it to the church door. Nobody takes them up. So because of the advent of the printing press in the 1450s in Germany, Luther starts writing a lot. And what he writes gets printed because you can print off a hundred copies a day of something someone writes rather than having to have somebody hand write it all. And he starts writing books. Fast forward four years, 1521. Shakespeare famously refers to this in Hamlet. 1521, Luther finally gets his opportunity for a debate, he thinks. He's invited by the Holy Roman Emperor to what's called the Diet of Worms. W-U-R-M-S. It's the town in Germany where this diet or meeting will take place. Shakespeare puns on it. He calls it a convocation of worms in Hamlet. Talking about Polonius' body being eaten. So, Luther thinks he's going there to have a discussion, have a good debate. He gets there, and on a table, piled in front of him, is everything he's spent the last four years writing. And this debate is this, take it all back. It's it. Recant. Say, oops, I was wrong. And according to his, one of his bi best biographers, Luther apparently said, oh, gee, let me pray about it. Maybe I was wrong. Let me pray about it, you know, meditate, think, and I'll come back tomorrow. He comes back tomorrow, and he says, unless proven, one, by Holy Scripture, or two, by conscience, or three, I can never remember the third one, here I stand, I can do no other. That is, nope, 
I stand by every word. This is all right. You are all wrong. And then he leaves. And that's really when everything starts taking off. Okay, because he writes more and stuff just starts flying off the um, printing press, so to speak. Okay, now what are some of the things Luke was talking about? I should have talked about this in my Shakespeare course, and I didn't. How are you saved? Faith alone, or to use the Latin, sola fides. Doesn't matter what you do. Good works don't buy you squat with God. Okay? It's solely God's grace, period. So what helps in that faith? Sola scriptura. Scripture alone. One, two, and the third one is sola. What happens when I go to Italy? Three very famous mottos. Sola fide, sola scriptura, and sola. Total blank. So, scripture alone, what does that mean? Through uh, eyes, knowing the It text. means Connor and his Bible. That's all he needs. You don't need a priest. You don't need a deacon. You don't need a church. Okay? Last one has something to do with mediator. Me and, me and Jesus. That's all I need. No, a prayer, right? You've got a friend in Jesus. That's right. all you need. Famous Doobie Brothers song. No, it's not, so, it's not prayer. Faith, scripture, and... You don't need a mediator other than Jesus, though. Okay? This is Reformation. Ah, what does this do to the quote unquote church? Okay. Prior to this, you've got the Western Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church. After this, you get what? Eastern Orthodox Church, Western Catholic Church, and the Protestant Church, which currently has over 22,000 denominations. Each of those denominations thinks what? Kyle's one. I've got the truth. JR's one. I've got the truth. Iman's one. I've got the truth. Jamie, I. No, you don't. Right. Yes, you do. No, you. Want to fight about it? You know. And what do you get? Chaos. Chaos. Okay. Prior to that, you had one church. Is this one grace? faith? Pardon? Is it by grace? Grace alone. Thank you. Sola gratia. Okay. How are you saved? By grace. God showers his grace upon you. That gives you the faith. The faith is built up by the script reading of scripture. And you don't need to have somebody bless you, baptize you, even though Luther wasn't against baptism. Okay. Other stuff. Luther was against imagery of, you know, stuff. He didn't like praying to saints. You don't need any saints. Though Luther did ask other people to pray for him. So what's the difference? You know. So all this kind of here. Back to Henry VIII for a moment. Henry VIII, 1521. Is called by Pope Leo, I think. Leo X? I've got it written down here somewhere. Yeah, Leo X. Defender of the faith. Why? Because Henry wrote a document called The Defense of the Seven Sacraments. Luther said there aren't seven sacraments. In fact, there aren't really sacraments per se. You got to take communion, but communion no longer meant what it meant before. What it meant before was you eat the wafer, you drink the wine, you're eating the bread, the body and blood of Christ. After Luther, no, no, no. You're just commemorating what happened at the Last Supper. Last Supper. It's a memorial. It's not really doing anything. Big debate 17th, uh, in the 1600s, 1500s. The real presence. Was Christ really present in those things? In the Middle Ages, Catholics developed this whole kind of theology of, anybody want to know what that's called? Remember the other day I had up here? Hoc est corpus. This is my body, which because of bad Latin becomes hocus pocus. Hocus pocus. 
At those words, a word called institution, transubstantiation occurs. That is, trans across the substance of those two elements, bread and wine, change into something else. The bread changes into the physical flesh of Christ. The wine changes into the physical blood of Christ. Their substance changes. Have we talked in here about oh, goodness. the difference between substance and accidents? The substance changes, but the accidents, its form, its appearance, remains the same. Bread and wine. What's the substance? Well, we were, what's the accidents of this? Writing. Its appearance. What's the writing on? Paper. What's the substance? The words on it? Tree. Oh. It's okay. made of wood pulp. Okay. The substance of this is what? You may not know. It's hundred percent cotton. Okay. Oh, cotton. The accidents shirt. Okay. The substance of yeah, I think those are. Well, this and this. The accidents begin is what? Glasses, right? What's the substance? Plastic. Plastic? What's the substance? Glass. What's plastic made out of? Oil. What's the substance of oil? You got to keep going back. Dinosaurs. Decaying body. Decaying animal and vegetative matter from 200 million years ago. Okay. And you could keep going. What's the substance of that? And you get back to 14.4 billion years, Big Bang. Oh, yeah? Well, what came before then? <laughs> Nobody knows, you know, according to some philosophy. So <laughs> substance and accidents become really important ideas. Um, Luther said in the Eucharist, the communion, there's no change. You're not really eating Christ's body and blood. You're merely doing what he did. Okay. So when he said, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood shit, he didn't really mean it. He was just talking symbolically, according to Luther and such. So he defended the seven sacraments, and this is what's really important, the supremacy of the Pope. Il Papa, the Father. Okay. And yet, just, I don't have it written down there, just 12 years later, okay, Henry has issued two acts, the Act of Succession and the Act of Supremacy. The Act of Succession was that, um, particularly for the aristocracy, you had to support Henry VIII's marriage to... Anne Boleyn. Okay. He had already had, uh, he had already divorced Catherine of Aragon. Okay. So that's part of the act of succession and then the act of supremacy. This is what made Henry the head of the English church. And we can forget about this. Pope's no longer important. Well, there's a couple reasons for that. One, the Pope wouldn't grant a divorce. The Pope wouldn't allow that divorce from um, Catherine. Henry had already been seeing Anne Boleyn. Okay? So Catherine, from Catherine comes Mary. From Anne Boleyn comes Elizabeth. So you got you to swear allegiance to Henry, and Henry is the new Pope. The Pope of the Anglican Church. Which is funny because, you know, he claims to be Protestant, but a lot of his practices are exactly the same as the Catholics. Well, at this point, though, Henry 
claiming to be Protestant was just in name only. I mean, it was the, in the Anglican Church in, let's say, 1533 was essentially just the Roman Church with a different name. We're still going to have prayer to saints. You're still going to have, you know, the Eucharist and all that kind of stuff. It's all essentially going to mean the same, with the exception of there are some dyed-in-the-wool, hardcore Protestants, okay, which we're going to talk about maybe in a couple minutes, okay? So, in 1536, Henry then passes what's called the dissolution of the monasteries. That is, the dissolving doesn't mean they get acid. It means they break them all up. So you pretty much, I can't think of one off the top of my head. You, you can't really go to a monastery pre-1500 today and have that monastery be totally intact. Because one of the things that happened with the dissolution of the monasteries is one, all the abbots and monks are kicked out. That is literally kicked out of the monastery so they're not all homeless. While at the same time, Parliament is passing laws against homelessness and, poor, and being poor. It's against the law to be poor. Reason that one out, okay? So if you're poor, you can get thrown in jail. How do you make the money to get for getting out of jail? Yeah, they didn't quite work that one out. So... What are they doing with all the monastery land and buildings? Well, Henry starts auctioning it off. Because when he becomes head of the English church, guess what else he becomes head of? Yeah, which is about half the property in England. So why does he do this? For what? Power and money? It's not the power as much, because he has that. It's the money, but he needs the money for what? War. war. Whenever an English king starts taxing heavily, they got a war to fight. Who's his war against? Who are the English always fighting? The, the French. French. Okay? The French. So, he starts selling off this land. Who's he sell it to? Rich guys, rich friends. They take the monastery property, they take buildings, they start tearing them down, using the stone from that building to build their nice new mansions and manor houses and such. So when you go to a lot of monasteries today, they're in ruins. That's the number one reason. Before that is the Viking invasions, okay, where they did that to some of them. So that's the dissolution of the monasteries. Um, let me back up for, we've got seven minutes. I can do this in seven minutes. John Calvin, another Protestant reformer, in one sense more important than Luther, Definitely more important than Luther for English literature. Okay? We ought to have a, a course, frankly, I think. There ought to be a course just titled, you know, Christianity for English Majors. That is, from its beginning and its history. Why? Because so much of the literature is informed by all of this. So, Calvin, he's a Frenchman, but he lives in Geneva, Switzerland. And in 1536, the same year as the Dissolution Monastery, Calvin writes the Institutes of the Christian Religion. What he really means is the Institutes of the Reformed Christian Religion. Calvin's the founder of what's called the Reformed Church. In Scotland, its name is the Presbyterian Church. These become the real hardcore Protestants. I used to be this. Nickname in college was a small Presbyterian school, TR, totally reformed. Mm -hmm. Now I'm Orthodox Christian, you know, pray to saints, have icons, totally. If I go back to that school, they can't know that because they'll want to still <laughs> string me up. So, where am I? Institutes of the Christian Religion which can be unfairly summed up with this five-letter mnemonic device. Tulip. Sounds pretty. Not so much. T. Total, Total depravity. depravity. Total depravity. What does that mean? We all suck. Well, that's a pretty good way of putting it. We all suck. How so? 
there's nothing good in humans, and like we have to. Is it that there's nothing? nothing good, uh, sorry, You're really close. Uh, my pastor is here right now. He's very it's, disappointed. It's not that we're. It's not that there's nothing good. It's that no matter what we do, no matter what good we do, yeah. it's all tainted by sin. Everything. Going out Thanksgiving, working at Salvation Army, working in a food line, serving meals to the hungry, to the homeless, etc. Being Mother Teresa in Calcutta for 50 years. Something in her did that for nefarious reasons. The nefarious might be simply, it made her feel good. It might make you feel better that you're fat and stuffed to go off Thanksgiving afternoon and help people who are a little well, less well off. Okay? So, ego, narcissism, touches essentially everything. Ultimately, you could trace that back to the first of the seven deadly sins, pride. Okay? Total depravity. You. Keep going. It's unconditional. Yep. We've used the word right here. Uh, not there. Unconditional election. Yeah. So, total depravity, unconditional election. What does that mean? Assume I'm God for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> saved, saved, saved. I won't be sexist. <laughs> saved. <laughs> Rest you go to hell. Damn. Okay. Uh, like Why? Winter, winter yeah, that's tied to it, because I chose it that way. It's unconditional. That is, no matter how much Kyle prays to me, too bad. <laughs> no matter how many people Kyle helps, too bad. Why? I didn't elect you. <laughs> Sucks, man. Okay? I should try it harder on that speech. So, unconditional election, which leads to the L, limited atonement. Notwithstanding... What St. Paul says about Christ dying for all men, he didn't really. He only died for the unconditionally elect. So all of you who I didn't save, it's because he didn't die for you. He died for everybody else, those four. Notice, by the way, I only chose four out of about 17 or 18. Why? Because Calvin thought the number of the elect, really small number. Really small, yeah. So those four of you are in, you got it made. Right? It's limited atonement. I, irresistible grace. Sorry. Yeah, unconditional election, irresistible grace. If I, as God, shower my grace on Brianna, guess what? She can't resist it. <laughs> she can't say, you, no. <laughs> If whoever God chooses, that's it. Which leads to, to, to P, perseverance of the saints. If you've been elected, if the atonement was for you, if the grace was showered down upon you, then you will persevere to the end. That is... You won't get on your deathbed and go, oh yeah, you God. Because that would kind of, yeah, that's not persevering. Persevering is as thou willest. As, you know. Persevering is not my will, but thine be done. Okay? So again, Calvin actually called this his, he used this word, but he did it in Latin. Horrible theology. He realized what it meant, you know. Because it means the vast majority of us were screwed. <laughs> Literally, you know, for all eternity. Okay? I wonder what he believed. Was he saved? Do you think he believed that he was saved? Or... Yeah, I think so. I think he just wasn't really 
<laughs> okay, we'll stop there. We'll pick up maybe <laughs> with Shakespeare on Thursday. We're so far behind. <laughs> Oh, do you? I'm not teaching it next semester, so if that makes a difference. Well, you could take this again, or you could take my history of the English language course. It's at 8 a.m. Never. Hey, look at the bright side. We should, we should congratulate.